Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Gross and it is my great pleasure to welcome George Mombio in today's episode. He's a prolific author, journalist and activist and this episode came together through a collaboration with Comunia who together with Bund Jugend, put together an edited volume on the topic of public luxury, a concept coined by George Monbiot. The book is called Öffentlicher Luxus and it was published by the great Karl Dietz Verlag Berlin. It's fantastic and you should get it. If you don't need a physical copy, you'll find a link to the digital version of the full book in the show notes. Big shout out to Comunia, who are doing absolutely fantastic work in the field of socialization in Germany. And I am very much looking forward to the upcoming second Vergesellschaftungskonferenz, Socialization Conference, of which Future Histories will be, as it was with the first one, an official media partner. I'm very proud. So more on this soon. What you will also find in the show notes is a link to a workshop held by Comunia on the topic of public luxury in February in Vienna. I think you can still register to this one. So if you're interested in the topic, go ahead. You'll find the link in the show notes and maybe we will see each other there. Before we start, I would like to welcome Alexander as a patron of Future Histories and I want to thank Lucas and Samuel for their donations. And now, please enjoy today's episode with George Monbiot on public luxury. Welcome, George. Hi, how are you doing? George, right now it feels like everything is going to shit on multiple levels, actually. And more and more people, I would say, are starting to feel the pressure that the current poly crisis is exerting in their own lives. In these times, a positive and attractive alternative notion of what the future could hold for all of us is very much needed. And not only does it uh, need to be positive, but it crucially also needs to feel possible and tangible, I would say. So people will need to hear it and be able to say, yeah, I could imagine that to happen. We need to fight for it for sure, but it could happen. So you have used uh, the idea of public luxury as a carrier for such an alternative notion of our collective futures. Could you maybe explain to us what you mean by that? What is public luxury? The idea comes from the thought that there simply is not enough ecological space or even physical space for everyone to pursue private luxury. The promise of capitalism and the reason why so many people go along with it and accept this extremely destructive world-eating system is that they believe they are temporarily embarrassed millionaires. They think that one day the finger will point at them because that is the promise. The promise is that uh, we can all aspire to private luxury. That's why we buy into it, literally. But we can't. And there's a couple of reasons why we can't. Um, the first is that some people can achieve private luxury because they exploit other people. The extreme wealth of those who live in luxury is the result of the exploitation of those who don't. So simply, in, in basic mathematical terms, you can't have everyone at the top. You know, the promise of capitalism is that everyone can be number one, but um, there are basic arithmetic reasons why that cannot work. But there's also uh, an even bigger reason, which is that if everyone achieved private luxury, we would burn through the living planet in a matter of days. Uh, the, the footprints, uh, the ecological footprint of the very rich is massively greater than than the footprint of of the median or especially the poorer citizens of the world so it, it's simply impossible to fulfill the promise of, of capitalism and you can't even do it in terms of physical space if everyone in london had uh, their own swimming pool and their own tennis court and their own art collection and their own playground for the, their kids then London would occupy a large proportion of England. Where would everyone else live? England would occupy a large proportion of Europe. You know, there's just not enough planet, even in physical terms. But public luxury, which means magnificent 
public swimming pools and tennis courts and art collections and playgrounds and public transport and all the other things that people try to achieve with their own money. But if we achieve it together, not only does that create space for people rather than taking it away from everyone else, but it can also be achieved at much, much lower ecological cost because you need only create one set of tennis courts or one large swimming pool for thousands and thousands of people to use rather than individuating the provision as private luxury does. And so my call is is for what I call private sufficiency, public luxury. You know, I think it's perfectly legitimate for us all to have our own modest private domain, our, our own modest home and and the particular things that we need to lead a decent life within that home. But if we want to aspire to luxury, we should do it within the public domain. That doesn't just mean state provision, incidentally, it can also mean community ownership of resources, which in some cases can be more appropriate. Okay, maybe let's dig a little deeper into that and maybe paint a picture that is that has a bit more detail uh, when it comes to how this might play out for all of us. Because as you pointed out, there's an upper limit um, and there's a lower limit. So what would these lives look like? What would be examples for public luxury, but also for the sufficiency that we will uh, engage in. So how much is luxury in the public sphere and how much is sufficiency in the private sphere? It, it's hard to draw hard and fast boundaries, um, not least because the science keeps changing. We keep discovering, well, how much tighter it's getting every year. There was a new paper published uh, just two weeks ago showing that we, at current levels of emissions, we really have just six years left before we exceed a 50% chance of breaching 1.5 degrees of, of global heating. And so there's almost no space left. We have an extremely tight carbon budget. Ecological budgets could be even tighter. I mean, we, we are breaching planetary boundaries, left, right, and center. You know, the planetary boundaries um, framework, which has been established by, by scientists, is very useful, but it It's quite crude at the same time because it lumps everything together. You know, it looks at novel substances, for instance, or it looks at biodiversity loss, or it looks at um, land use transformation. But these things within them, there are thousands of different ecosystems and thousands of different impacts taking place. And when you break it down in a more granular way, you see that we are just on the cusp of pushing loads of ecosystems past their tipping points. If you look at what's going on in marine systems, for instance, combination of industrial fishing, of pollution, of global heating and the acidification of the seas, is it's, it's already destroying tropical coral reefs. It's destroying entire ecosystems. We've seen it with the Grand Banks off Newfoundland. You know, people say it's fisheries collapse. It's not. It's ecosystem collapse. Uh, we see it again and again and again, cascading collapse all over marine systems. We've seen it very similarly in many terrestrial systems, perhaps the most dangerous of which from the human point of view is the collapse of soil. Uh, 99% of our calories come from the soil. And basically, in all these cases, the more we know, the worse the situation looks. So the tighter the budget has to be. A few years ago, people were saying, well, The um, sustainable budget for carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions is the equivalent of two tons per or two tons of carbon per person per year. It's a lot tighter than that now. Um, I haven't seen a calculation published in 2023, but it's almost certainly below one ton. And yet the one percent on average are using 70 tons of carbon per year. Whereas billionaires, on average, use about 7,000 tons to, in some cases, 20 or 30,000 tons of carbon per year. Now, you know, let's go back to the promise of capitalism. It's that we're all going to be those people one day. Well, how is that possible? You know, it just can't be done. You can't all run private jets and super yachts and giga homes and all the other um, appurtenances of being a billionaire. So... It's all we can say for sure is that it's really, really tight and it's probably tighter even than we think. We're in emergency mode now. And 
And of course, that's a very dangerous situation politically as well as ecologically, because it means we're hitting political cliff edges. And we've seen what seen in the Netherlands what happens when you when you hit that cliff edge. So so scientists have been warning in the Netherlands that it had a nitrate crisis from the ni- 1980s onwards, but the successive governments were very slow to act. Um, they didn't put in the measures which could have addressed that problem slowly and and painlessly, where every year you can just dial it down a little bit until you get below the, the, the limits you need to reach in order not to cause ecosystem collapse. But because governments kept kicking the ball forward to the next administration and the next one and the next one, it's not my problem. It's uh, within the next four or five years, it's not going to mature as a problem, so we can just leave it. You get to a situation where suddenly there's a, a legal challenge it's breaking European law. The state council says you have to take action and you, you have to go from a situation of massive nitrate pollution to very little nitrate pollution within an extremely short space of time. And that means taking quite drastic political action, including saying we're going to have to shut down certain livestock operations. And that then triggers a massive political backlash, as, as we've seen. And what I fear is that we're going to see very similar situations on on one ecological issue after another. That because governments all around the world have failed to take action, if we're going to stop Earth systems from tipping, they're going to have to take very sudden and very drastic action, and that will trigger a massive political backlash. And they know that, so they're not going to take it. And rather than face the prospect of losing office, they prefer to face the prospect of losing Earth systems, of creating basically an uninhabitable planet. So we're not in a good place, you know, (laughs) always when we're discussing these issues, you know, you say, well, I wouldn't start from here. But unfortunately, we don't have much choice about that. This is where we are. It's it's a bad place. And just, just to add to this, I hope you don't mind me to riffing on this a bit because it's it's uppermost in my mind at the moment because of the dire situation we're in in the UK. And the UK is a very good example of how badly wrong things can go even in an extremely rich nation, a nation which has been exploiting much of the world for, for centuries, harvested a huge amount of money and wealth, and yet is now facing extreme social dislocation, extreme poverty, and the collapse of public services. And that's the result of 40 years of neoliberalism. We call it different things. Some people say, oh, it's Thatcherism, it's Reaganism, it's austerity, it's trussonomics. There's all all these sort of individuated um, names for what it is, but it's not. It's the same doctrine which has been pursued now for about 40 years. And the result is that we have massive funding deficits in just about every single public sector. So for, in some of them, they are quite clearly estimated in the National Health Service, for instance, it's a £200 billion deficit since uh, the Conservatives came back into office in 2010. For sewerage, it's about £600 billion. The rest of the water system would probably take that up to around a trillion pounds that need to be spent to get a 21st century water and sewage system in this country. We've got a crisis of school buildings collapsing because they were built with inferior materials and they weren't designed to last and they've never been upgraded. There hasn't been a full school rebuilding program for a long time. That would be a few more hundred billion to to resolve. Similarly, with a lot of domestic buildings, we now see big tower blocks in danger of collapse. We still see them covered in flammable cladding, which could cause more Grenfell Tower disasters. We've got a massive deficit in the provision of social housing, probably another trillion or so. You start adding it up and you are talking many trillions of pounds of spending if we are to just sort of get back to a situation in which there is general provision for for the people of this country. So it is a very dire situation. You know, we we have this this great crunch coming. We've got the ecological crunch. You know, people talk about a climate crisis. It's an earth systems crisis. It's every single earth system now is, is, is heading towards tipping points. 
and we have a massive fiscal crunch as a result of these years and years and years of neoliberal austerity, cutting public services and diverting the money instead into the pockets of the very rich. And at the same time, we have a number of other global crises which we are completely failing to address, like, for instance, the food crisis. And we didn't really have much of a food crisis until recently because it all looked as if it was heading in the right direction. There were you know, quite strong hopes that we were going to meet Sustainable Development Goal 2.1, which is eliminating global hunger by 2030. The trend was heading clearly in that direction from the 1960s until 2014. It was, you know, there was a very steep decline in global hunger. It was looking great. And then in 2015, it started ticking up again. And now we've already lost about 10 years of that progress because there's an extra 120 million people hungry now, even by comparison to 2019. You know, it's, it's a really, really frightening situation. And what we could be seeing on top of everything else is systemic global food system failure, similar to the failure of the financial system in 2008, which was just about to collapse before it was bailed out with massive government spending. Can we bail out the food system? You know, they managed to save the financial system by inventing future money. Quantitative easing was the creation of future money. You, you can't save the food system by creating future food. So we got all these massive converging crises. You talk of a poly crisis, you're quite right to do so, but I think it's even bigger, much, much bigger than most people assume. So, you know, I know we're trying to be optimistic here and and uh, we will come to this, but but we just have to accept the reality of how blinking difficult this is, um, of how many things are all converging at the same time and how we will look back to the past 60 or 70 years, well, really since about 1945, as being a, a, a golden era by comparison that to everything that will follow. There, there is no repeating that time. We, we burnt through resources at a phenomenal rate. We can't do that anymore. Um, that helped to generate a great deal of liquid wealth with which we were able to build public services. But that then was reversed deliberately and very effectively through the neoliberal era from about 1979 onwards. And, and the deficits are such that we will never, ever plug those holes. We won't get to back to the era of generalised prosperity that we had before, that we just have to accept. So we have to make the best of a very difficult and, shall we say, suboptimal situation. And we have very little time in which to do it. And so as a result of that, we have to use all remaining available resources, planetary and financial, as efficiently and parsimoniously as we possibly can. And that is a very powerful reason, I believe, for pursuing public luxury rather than private luxury. Right. And I think also it's an important point when it comes to this political question that you addressed, because we will have to get people on board. And you stated that the, the form of luxury that we had here in the West for some time now will have to have an end. But at the same time, it's equally in uh, a reality that for most of the people globally, the form of public luxury that you're envisioning is very much a better uh, living standard. So there is a very attractive offer encapsulated in yes. this idea of pu public yeah. luxury. And I'm very curious about this offer because I think um, while it is super important to point out the urgency and the like factual disaster <laughs> that is happening in front of our eyes, as you did right now, it's equally important to point out that there is something to gain for the yes. many. And yeah. this is, as I understand it, uh, this idea of public luxury. So maybe we could get into what this actually might entail, because there's also this um, framework of universal basic services, for example, floating around, which is quite similar in a certain sense. So uh, what would be covered through public luxury? Mm -hmm. And would it be unconditional? Because this is also quite attractive. Yes, yes. So The first thing I want to say is, is that I don't want my proposals to compete in any way with 
other proposals such as universal basic services, I think they're totally compatible. I think they, they're they complementary to each other because, as the name suggests, universal basic services is not really in the business of supplying luxuries, but it's in the business of making sure that our necessities are met and that everyone has free access to those necessities, which is obviously an absolutely essential c- component. And so... I guess you would really say, actually, we need three things. We need private sufficiency, we need universal basic services, and we need public luxury. And I don't want to sort of bundle those basic services into public luxury because they are slightly different things. And, you know, public luxury obviously is not unlimited because there will always be limitations on what we can do, and we have to accept those limitations. And in fact, accepting limitations, you know, the idea of we can have enough, and then we can stop when we've got enough. I think it's absolutely essential to being responsible 21st century citizens and to and to ensuring that you can have realistic political aims. So that's quite an important component of it is to say, you know, don't expect the moon on a stick, but do expect the one habitable planet that we know of to be habitable for everyone and that everyone can have a decent quality of life, but not a massive quantity of life you know that's the that's really the um the promise we we should be making to ourselves and to everyone else so what would it look like well you know if, if we look at the public domain for instance one of the first things you the most visible thing and the most obvious thing and perhaps the most important thing that you need to be looking at is land is who controls it, who has access to it, who's using it, and for what purposes. These these are really important questions and perennially neglected in in politics. You know, land is, oh, well, that's a place where you put houses. Um, and, And obviously we need houses and, you know, we need to allocate land carefully and we need farming and lots of other things. But we also, to create anything like a high quality of human life, and viable communities, you need public land. You need land that everyone can use, land that everyone can enjoy, land where they can meet each other, land where they can exercise, land where they can have fun. You know, all, all, all the things which make our lives worth living happen in that public domain. And the public domain has to have a physical base to it. And I'm not saying that it's all going to be open land. There needs to be land in which you can build public buildings and do indoor activities which are luxurious and which enhance our quality of life, such as a luxurious indoor swimming pool, for instance, and and other great community facilities that that, that you can envisage. But but you know it's allocating that land is really at the core of it. And to say we are setting aside land which cannot be captured by private interests, which which cannot be enclosed, to use the old term of you know the capture of land by private interests, and will belong to to the public. That and as I said before, that doesn't necessarily mean the state. In in many cases, it's far more appropriate that it belongs to the community and becomes a commons. And and a commons really is at the core of this. Commons is a crucial neglected sphere of the economy. It's not, it's not private. It's not state. Um, it's not capitalist. It's not communist. It's a different sphere altogether. A commons is a a resource which is managed by a community. Nobody owns it um, definitively because you have a duty to pass it down to future generations in 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 the same or better state in in which you found it. It's either. Um, the resource itself or the output of the resource is shared equally between the members of the community and it creates uh, benefits for everyone who, who is involved in it. And we have some very good examples in all over Europe. You know, public park, which is owned by communities. Uh, there are some, some of them are mostly state controlled, but but community owned parks are a great example of a land-based commons. In the UK, we have a system called allotments, um, where land is set aside for people to grow food on. And and this was, it was basically a sort of substitute for the proper land reform that we needed in this country. It was a bit of a sop. Uh, we say, okay, we've, we've taken most of the land away from you. We'll give a little bit back so that you have you can feel it hasn't all gone. And actually, these allotments have turned out to be really important for, for people's well-being. I, I, I had 
an allotment for a long time when I in the previous place I lived in. And I don't know how I would have coped without it. Um, it was really important for my mental health, but also for my connections with the community. So this was an area of land. It was could only have been about three, four hectares, maybe. It divided into 200 little plots, each of which was calculated, estimated to be the amount of land from which a family could provide itself with vegetables. That's basically what the uh, what the size of the plot was based on. And so it was, yeah, 220 in total, 220 plots in this. And and all of them quite intensely cultivated, and some of them very productive, some some more successful than others, but producing really quite a, a large amount of food for the amount of land involved. I mean, just a small proportion of 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 the city's food, obviously, because um, there's only small amounts of land handed over. But it on that allotment, not it was uh, controlled entirely by the allotment holders. So you had a members association of the 220 allotment holders who would make the decisions as to how the land was used and allocated. It was technically owned by the council, but we actually had rights in perpetuity. So there was a sort of co-ownership with, with the council. And it was controlled entirely by its own members, which is a crucial aspect of the commons. And what it did, apart from giving you this outdoor space where it was yours but not just yours and you sort of it was almost like having a garden which you couldn't otherwise afford with with your small house it also introduced you to communities you might never otherwise have met and one of the amazing features of this was that across that those 220 plots there were people who's who must have come from about 30 or 40 countries of origin from all over the world. It was quite extraordinary. The, the amazing diversity of languages, of experiences, of stories, and and you meet each other on equal terms because you've all got the same amount of land. You, you're all struggling with similar constraints. You know, you've got the problems with the weather, you've got pests, you've got you know, um, issues with soil, whatever. And so you're constantly swapping expertise, sw- giving seeds to each other, swapping produce, the the people on the plot next door to me were Serbian refugees, and and they really loved the plums and medlars that I was growing on my allotment. And I we had a massive surplus of plums. We couldn't we we couldn't eat them all ourselves, and we never quite got the hang of cooking with medlars. But in the Balkans, medlars this sort of quite obscure fruit um, are very very popular. And so we gave them our medlars and and quite a few of our plums and some of our apples, and they gave us some wonderful vegetables, beans and potatoes and chard and other things that they were growing. And and we learned quite a lot from each other, uh, not just about growing, but about cooking. But then also we told our stories. So it's you can see how land can instantly start to bring people together. And and food can bring people together as well. I mean, the word companion comes from the Latin companes, with bread. And, and it's that um, a companion is someone with whom you break bread. And so having places in which you can have community meals, luxurious community meals, where you can all come together, prepare something together, eat it together, instead of going to a fancy restaurant, you effectively create in the public domain the equivalent of a fancy restaurant, which is much, much cheaper and is not exclusive. That's the key thing, you know, that fancy restaurants, of course, are exclusive. Only a small proportion of the population can afford to eat there, but everyone can afford to have luxurious community meals where where, where you get together in a common space. I think we kind of uh, get to a point where a certain question needs to be answered because you already pointed towards the commons as a really crucial element in this. And you pointed towards the inefficiency uh, as well as the excluding element of private property because private property is not able to 
produce this type of community that you're right now talking about. So if we're talking about land reform, and we should, as you rightly stated so, then we will get into a conflict with those who right now own this land as private property. So there will be some kind of um, <laughs> conflict to be had in order to get to this state where uh, things are held in common as commons. So I would be interested because this is also, of course, an element of public luxury. You have this private sufficiency, which means, of course, many will gain a lot and this will be super attractive, hopefully, for the many. But there are the few who will lose out and they should. But right now, as it happens, those are the people who have the political power, who have the economic power. And I, I'm sorry, but I have to add, they have also the military power. And if we think of something like the uh, democratic socialism of Salvador Allende and how this played out, we will have to think about this as well. So how do we get to a point where we will be able to implement this type of sharing in common, which will lead to us sustaining the planet in a, in a way that is actually sustaining it. Yes, thanks. Yeah, no, again, we have to concede all this is very difficult. You know, if I were to come on this podcast and say, yeah, it's easy, we can just do it like this, then I, I would be lying to you. You know, these, these are, we're up against a lot of constraints, not least because, as you so rightly say, they have the resources and they have the power. And this hasn't come about by accident. Part of the whole point of neoliberalism was to turn economic power into political power, to, to return to a situation of plutocracy to displace democracy. That was very much the thrust of it. William Davis at Goldsmith um, College has a lovely definition of neoliberalism, which is the disenchantment of politics by economics. And it's, it's basically, it was an assault on democracy. I mean, democracy is a problem that capitalism is always trying to solve. And neoliberal ideology is a very effective means of solving that problem. And what we've seen worldwide is power being sucked out of democratic institutions. They've been hollowed out, as Professor Colin Crouch has argued, and you end up with a kind of neutron bomb politics where you've still got the institution standing, you've still got the buildings, you've still got the protocols, you've still got parliament sitting and talking, but actually power has bled away into other spheres. It's gone into <laughs> private discussions between governments and oligarchs, It's gone offshore, like the offshore arbitration tribunals, the um, investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, which basically override democratic decision making. Corporations can sue states for decisions they don't like, and those states are forced to hand over billions and billions of dollars because they've upset um, corporate plans for, for making vast amounts of money. There's, there's lots of ways in which power has been bled out sucked away from citizens and handed over to oligarchs, plutocrats, kleptocrats around the world. When neoliberals say, let the market decide, we should examine what that thing, the market means. It's basically let the money decide. And when you let the money decide, you let the people with the most money decide. It's basically saying, let the plutocrats decide. That's, that's what it really means. And that's what has been happening. And they have gained power immensely at our expense. Um, you mentioned Salvador Allende. That was done in a very crude way, uh, a military coup um, supported by not just Western governments, but the neoliberal economists trained specifically for Pinochet, what turned into Pinochet's economics at the University of Chicago and elsewhere, and implemented the, the full neoliberal agenda there following the coup. But it's been done more subtly and slowly in, in in other nations where um, it would be harder to overthrow them with a coup, but with similar end results that, you know, it's a bit like the the famous um, phrase in Africa, which said, when, when, when the white man came to Africa, we had the land and he had the Bible. He told us to close our eyes and pray. And when we opened them, he had the land and we had the Bible. And it's a bit like that with neoliberalism. You know, you can say that as a You know, when the neoliberals turned up, you know, we had the we had the public sphere. We we were in control of politics. They um, 
uh, and they had the road to serfdom and the constitution of liberty. They told us to close our eyes, grab hold of these books, and 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 by the time we opened them, they had everything. And to hell with the supposed neoliberal principles in those books. It was socialism for the rich and neoliberalism for the poor. Um, and and so again, we're in a very difficult position where we have to displace that existing power in order to return both to democracy and to a lively public sphere. And that includes land. Now, there are plenty of non-violent mechanisms of doing this, and taxation is is the most obvious one. You um, start introducing land taxes, you make it expensive for people to own large tracts of, of land which could be in the public domain, and you can start to to push it in a more democratic direction. But as you say, people are going to resist this. The people with the power will resist this very hard. And, you know, the only thing that is in our favour is that we are many and they are few. You know, they might have the money, they might have the media, they might have the ear of government, they, they might have the weapons. It does require massive, massive mobilisation. And, you know, we've seen there are many instances in history where mass mobilization overturned extremely rigid power structures. I, I think that the society is a complex system, right? And, and all complex systems have equilibrium states and they have tipping points and they can tip from one equilibrium state into a different equilibrium state. And society, I believe, has two equilibrium states. One is impossible, the other is inevitable. And and you're in a, in any at any one time, you say your situation is impossible. It appears to be impossible. You know, if if you looked at um, women's suffrage, for instance, if if you went to the sort of 1890s in most parts of Europe and said, you know, will women ever have the vote? Impossible. It's just not going to happen. The, the patriarchal system is simply too powerful. The men are never going to give up 50% of their power. How is that ever going to happen? It's just impossible. And within a few decades, it became inevitable. You know, but once it had happened, you look back and say, well, of course that was going to happen. How could that not happen? You know, and the same goes, for instance, with um, gay rights and equal marriage. In the 1980s, if you'd said, you know, what are the prospects across Western Europe for, for, for equal marriage, equal marriage legislation passed by governments? Impossible. You know, it's society is homophobic. Homophobia has been there for centuries. Um, it's it's just part of how society is. We got we're up against the conservatives. We're up against the church. We're up against all these massive forces in society. Then a few decades later, well, of course that was going to happen. It's inevitable. You know, same with abortion. Same with certain aspects of women's liberation. Obviously, still a long way to go. Same with smoking. When I was in my 20s, quite a long time ago, um, you know, every public space was just a fog of blue smoke. And now in, in my country, if you see anyone smoking, it's like they're at high school again, hiding behind the dustbins, <laughs> furtively taking a cigarette. You know, we, we see these tipping points have happened again and again and again. And in every case, they've gone from impossible to inevitable. You know, it, it, it can't happen it was bound to happen. Those are the two equilibrium states for any issue in, in society, and, and they tip. So, so it's very easy to create a completely pessimistic picture and say, that can't possibly happen. You know, what, the, what, what I sketched out at the beginning sounded pretty pessimistic, but that's only because we, we are sort of always trapped within our moment. You know, we conceive the future as repeated instances of the present, and we imagine it can't possibly change. But that's because we tend to regard society as if it were a simple system and not a complex system. And, and this is, I think, one of the greatest deficits in our education. And so few of us are ever taught in school or even in university about how complex systems function. We're taught about complex systems, we're taught about ecosystems, we're talking, taught about social systems, but we're taught about them as if they were simple systems, we're like circuit diagrams, you know, as if it were an electrical circuit or a plumbing map. This is how, this is how the economy works. This is how an ecosystem works. But actually, it just doesn't work that way. It, it, it works in completely different ways to a simple system. Change does not happen in linear and gradual ways in a complex system. It, it tends to absorb change, absorb change, absorb change. And during that whole time, you're, you're 
it plateaus and you think nothing's going to change. This is just how it is. And then suddenly, bang, it tips into a different state. So, so you know, this is absolutely not a council of despair. At any moment in history, you would seem to have very good reasons for despair. And then a few years later, you say, why was anybody despairing about that? Of course, it was going to happen. Yeah, and I, for once, am absolutely in the camp of alternative uh, desirable futures can definitely happen. And actually, they must happen or it will be barbarism for sure. And so uh, you would not have to convince me, but I have to add that the examples that you gave me, like gay rights or voting and stuff like that, um, that these are examples that are quite a bit different from a crucial topic that will need to be addressed, which is property. So we have been there before in, the, in our conversation, and I think there's a really good question that you asked within your text, uh, which, is, which, which should be quite obvious, but which is so ingrained in a form of naturalization of private property that yeah. people tend to not ask it. And you ask, yeah. what gives you the right to appropriate parts of nature just because you have money? Yeah. So there's yeah. no intrinsic connection between the two, actually. But <laughs> no, in our no. societies, uh, people tend to believe there, there is, but it isn't. So if we, if we acknowledge this, that there is no intrinsic connection whatsoever between the two, then we would get to a place where the whole way in which we engage with nature, the, the um, let's say, socio-metabolic mechanism that we set up for our social relation uh, with nature, that this will need to be based on fundamentally different paradigms, so to speak, not paradigms that derive rights of uh, uh, nature abuse from money and private property, but they will have to be enacted in a very different way. And there is a, an, I think, interesting and very much uh, related research strand around questions of democratic economic planning or democratic planning in a more broader sense that I think would be a very fruitful ally in this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I would be interested if this is something that you engage with, because if we say that money should, and markets for that matter, should not be the um, steering mechanism, um, or at least the dominant steering mechanism through which this relation is mediated, then the question comes up, what should it be then? What would be the alternative? And of course, the first thing that comes up is it should be democratic, but then the questions <laughs> yeah, actually course, come up even course. more. So I would be interested, what, what is yeah. your thinking around these questions? Because they are so crucial and the heart of the whole thing, I would say. Yeah, no, all good and absolutely crucial questions. I would actually say they're not that different from the women's suffrage question, because, you know, if, if you go back to the 19th century, you know, there was, it was just an absolutely implicit plank of political systems that men, to control and even own women. You know, there were legal instruments giving men effective ownership over women and over ownership over all their resources, ownership of their decision making, all of that. And and it was just for the for the great part of society unquestioned. That was just the way it was. And just as there is no intrinsic connection between the numbers of your in your bank account and your right to own vast tracts of natural wealth. There was no intrinsic connection between being male and your right to own and control women. But those things were assumed to be one and the same. And so, sorry, go, go on, yeah? No, just to clarify this, I think the uh, for me the difference is that women's right to vote could be easily integrated into capitalism as well as gay rights could be. So this was uh, this is something that can be included in a way that will make sure that that still <laughs> certain elements will not be touched. And one of these elements that should not be touched through the eyes of capitalism is the question of property rights. Yes, well, well that's true. But then it, they could not be integrated into patriarchy, which was another immensely powerful force, mm, which, mm, you know, mm. where it said there's all sorts of untouchables here. So, so all, all I'm saying is there's no reason to despair because these are completely different questions. It was just as implausible a few decades before it happened, that women would get the vote, as it is that we can have a, a democratic use of property and, and, and a democratized economy. 
And the necessity, the urgency is just as great. And the barriers are, I think, probably no greater than the barriers that women faced. And that might sound ridiculous because the barriers seem enormous. But from the perspective of women in the late 19th century, those barriers were just as great. It was just as impossible. And so, you know, we are in the impossible equilibrium state. But there is an inevitable equilibrium state as well, which, which can can be reached. Now, the question is, can it be reached without crisis? Almost certainly not. You know, there, there will be crises which um, both you know, are, will be extremely tough, but also create opportunities for changing things and for saying, well, this system does not work. <laughs> how, how much more obvious can it be that this system does not work? And... Yes, uh, what we have to do is to challenge something as fundamental to social conditioning as patriarchy was. And that fundamental thing we have to challenge is that some people have more right to the world's natural wealth than other people have. And and it, it's, you know, that there's absolutely no principle, no sound principle, which says that some people should have that right, should have a greater right than others to natural wealth. But it's just an assumption which is soaked into society in exactly the same way that the assumption that men should have control over women was soaked into society. So impossible things can change and can then become inevitable. That That's I, I'm sorry to keep repeating myself on this, but it's such an important thing for people to grasp that, you know, your situation now doesn't have to be your situation in the future. I would like to get a bit of a better sense of what the political imaginary, the broader political imaginary is that the, that you situate public luxury within. Because, I mean, you pointed towards the commons and you stated it's not markets, it's not communism either, you stated. So you kind of draw some kind of a line there, I guess, or something like that. But um, I would be interested in who, who would be the ally with which something like that would be possible. Because, I mean, I live in Vienna and we have a strong social democratic basis here in, in Vienna, yeah. of course, and yes, we have right, some Vienna. form yeah. of uh, yeah. public luxury, at least in some parts of our lives. And I really very much appreciate it, I have to say. But at the same time, social democracy historically has a certain tendency to kind of part with capital or to, to have a to have a pact with capital when it comes to yes. crucial moments yes, without uh, within mm. our history. So uh, my, my interest would be to hear something about the political imaginary and also the, let's say, maybe political platform that you imagine as a carrier through which public luxury can come about. So I, I'm very interested in the ideas of Murray Book Bookchin and his social ecology thinking. I don't think he's got quite all the answers, but I think there's quite a lot in there about how you can create political systems which are distributive by design, as as Kate Rayworth would say. I mean, she's I don't know what her relationship with Murray Bookchin is, but but um, you know, she uses this very important phrase, distributive by design. And that's what Murray Bookchin does um with his political thinking. I mean, he, he's no longer alive, but he had a great influence um, over some people's political development. The most obvious example of that is Rojava in uh, the sort of semi-autonomous region in northeastern Syria, where under extreme difficulty, attacks from all sides, really, the local people of Rojava have created a totally different political system to the one that we have. Now, the political system, the, the majority of those of us who live in so-called democratic systems have works like this. Every four or five years, you put a cross on a piece of paper, and then you are deemed to consent to everything that the winning side does in the next four or five years. So anything that's in their manifesto, their platform that they campaigned on, you are deemed to have consented to that, even if you didn't even vote for them, even if If the people who did vote for them hadn't actually read the manifesto, even if actually they were voting on just one issue, as most people do, you know, it's like the economy or it's crime or it's something like that, you're deemed to have consented to all the other issues in, in that manifesto. And then to consent to everything else that government chooses to do, 
until you voted out of office in four or five years. In other words, the entire system is based on the principle of presumed consent. Now, we don't accept presumed consent in sex. Why should we accept it in politics? But that is what our so-called democracies do. But there's a completely different way of doing it, which is a bottom-up way of doing it. And instead of grand decisions being made by a tiny number of people and then passed down to everyone else with this ridiculous system based on presumed consent, you have a system where the people make the decisions and pass those on up to ensure that they're implemented at, at, at the wider level. And that's a system which Book, Book Chin partly designed and which has been developed in Rojava. But it also you see elements of it in other parts of the world. And a classic example of that is in the Brazilian city of Porto Alegre, where between uh, particularly the years 1989 and 2004, mm -hmm. over that 15 years, when there was a Peite, Partido dos Trabalhadores um, government in Porto Alegre, they handed control of the municipal budget over to the people. Porto Alegre had been one of the poorest places in Brazil because it was more or less owned by the mafia. Um, it was completely dominated by corruption and clientelism. When public money was spent, it was spent to favour your brother-in-law or the godfather of this clan or whoever it might be. And it was just wasted, completely frittered away. By the time participatory budgeting had bedded in, Porto Alegre was number one in the human development index of, of, of all cities in Brazil. And there'd been a total transformation of its fortunes, um, massive decline in, mat in maternal mortality, massive decline in infant mortality, massively improved primary health care, education, sanitation and clean water, public transport, uh, because the people were making the decisions. The entire discretionary municipal budget was in their hands. And every year, about 50,000 people came together to decide how it was spent. And there was a very clever design for passing up those decisions and for making sure that the poorer areas didn't lose out. There was a sort of ratio system so that the budget was distributed according to need, but the, but the decisions over the budget were made by local people. And... And it just completely turned the city around. And it ended up with the extraordinary result, which any political scientist would tell you is impossible, of people taking to the streets and demonstrating to demand that their taxes were raised. And, and the reason for that was that they could see that if they spent the money together, it went a lot further than if they tried to spend it individually. So, for instance, if you're trying to get to work in the morning, and you're using private transport, you might pay $2,000 for a clapped out old car and then be stuck in a traffic jam for an hour on the way in and an hour on the way out. Or you can contribute $100 a year for a modern, efficient public tram system or monorail or whatever it might be and get there in 20 minutes rather than an hour. Your money goes much, much further when you're spending it in, in the public domain. And, and people saw that and acted on it. And what we saw is that when the people are in charge, the decisions are much greener, they're much fairer, they're much more egalitarian, and they're much more wide ranging than when you've got a small group in charge who are deemed to be our democratic representatives. Now, I think where I differ from Bookchin is that I think we need some representative democracy as well because there are certain decisions which it's very hard for participatory democracy to make. For instance, in terms of international policy, you know, what do we do about climate policy? What do we do about um, disarmament policy, for instance? What do we do about trade policy? It's, it's very hard to pass it all the way up from the local borough or village level right up to the global level like that. So we need some intermediation as well but any decision which can be made locally should be made locally. You know, everything should be devolved as much as possible, but there are limits to that devolution. So I would see a hybrid system, but obviously when you've got this mass participation, one of the things it does is it transforms people. It makes them into democratic citizens. They realise that they should be in charge. There is not a luxury to have genuine democratic engagement. It's actually a necessity if you're going to have a good society. And it's, it's our right. It's our right to have deliberative participatory politics rather than decisions handed down from on high in the name of representative democracy. 
And in fact, one of the fascinating aspects of participatory democracy is that it works better in practice than it does in theory. You know, you have endless people say, oh, that couldn't possibly work. People wouldn't be like that. They wouldn't behave like that. But because it transforms people and, and because they they see the immense power that they can wield in a in a distributed and democratic way, then it works in ways which which people couldn't predict. And what that does then is to ensure that representative power, if you've still got some representative democracy, can't get ahead of the people. It can't run away from us because we become much more engaged and politically literate citizens than we were before. Wonderful. Josh, there's a last question that I ask all of my guests, and it is, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? <laughs> what makes me joyful is the incredible bravery of certain people and certain movements, that what we've seen all over the world, even in the most impossible situations, totalitarian situations, um, situations where you can so easily be imprisoned for life or killed. I mean, even today, you know, there are environmental activists all over the world being being murdered for their activism, and yet they still do it. They still stand up and do it. And it's that human courage that makes me joyful because I realize that wherever there is courage, there is hope. George, thank you so much for being part of Future Histories. Thank you, Jan. A real pleasure. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories. Or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.